Well, uh, good morning again to the people here in the, uh, in the audience the live, and good morning to everybody watching uh, by satellite TV or on, on the internet. Uh, welcome to uh, this conference on health and social care interdisciplinary innovation and research. Um, I'm not going to eat into the first speaker's um, time for presenting. Uh, I would like to welcome Richard Bailey, who's the Acting Director for Government Office Southwest. So, Richard. Good, good morning, everyone, um, and uh, thank you very much, Ray. And um, uh, just briefly, as a civil servant at the government office, uh, we're running a show which is about offering 10 government departments in Whitehall a regional presence, uh, trying to link policy thinking in Whitehall with delivery on the ground. I'm very glad to be able to come and contribute today. I have to say I think I'm a poor choice. I'm not a clinician. I've never done research. I would add nothing to the Vice-Chancellor's next research assessment exercise. Uh, and also, I would say to those of you uh, who come at this agenda from the background of being psychologists and are interested in Myers-Briggs, like most senior civil servants, I'm strongly INT, which means I'm not much interested in data sets. So this is an odd conference to be at, but I have got, I hope, a few reflections on the structures we use in public administration to try and deliver services which are life critical uh, to citizens. And I'd like to reflect a little bit on how those work and why sometimes uh, they may not appear to be very effective. I want to talk very briefly about the origin of the silo structures that we often work with I want to share with you a very light touch study we did on some of these issues in the government office and I want to look at a couple of case studies uh, in trying to approach things in a slightly different way. But first of all, and this is the week when Doctor Who comes back on the screens, I want to take you back in time. It's 1919, we've just won the war to end all wars, we are going to build a land fit for heroes. And uh, senior civil servants are assembling under the chairmanship of Lord Haldane to reflect on how to do this and how to structure a government for this new task. And one of the things they looked at was how to structure government departments. Should they focus, for example, on particular client groups? Or should they focus on grouping professional disciplines for efficiency. Uh, and this is a quotation uh, from the report uh, on their comment on the possibility of looking at things from a client perspective. There might, for example, be a ministry for paupers, a ministry for children, a ministry for insured people, or a ministry for the unemployed. Now, the inevitable outcome of this method of organization is a tendency to Lilliputian administration. It's impossible that the specialized service which each department has to render to the community can be of the same high order when its work is at the same time limited to a particular class of persons and extended to every variety of provision for them as when the department concentrates on the provision of one particular service. There, I think, the authentic view of a bureaucrat. Um, now, I don't want to deny that silos can work. If you want to push up A-level results, leave it to the schools. It's worked quite well. But if you want to narrow the gap between the best performing and the least performing children in school, it's out of the control of the head teacher, and you've got to think about housing, the employment opportunities for the parents, and a whole raft of other things. But that vision from the Haldane Committee is what has actually driven the structure of public administration in Britain for the best part of 80 years. The main uh, initiative that came in the post-Second World War period, the Fulton Committee, looking at reforming public administration, was focused on strengthening the concept of professional expertise, but still very much within that silo. And during the 1980s, when we uh, found ourselves enjoying the benefits of the new managerialism introduced by the Thatcher administration, the focus was still on efficiency within a silo, uh, creating a better management culture 
and all the restructuring that came with it, with the creation of executive agencies, privatisation and contracting out, and I guess the NHS still feels a bit like that. Um, and what in practice people began to realise was that there were a lot of what I think the current government calls the wicked issues, which structures of that kind didn't really reach very well. And I want to take you into a little study that we did um, recently, looking at some of this in relation to vulnerable adults. And we asked simply, do the services provided to this client group meet the policy maker's aims, and do they meet the needs of the clients? Now, we defined vulnerable adults, our own definition, there are other definitions we could have used, it's our own definition because we wanted an inclusive one, people who have serious difficulties coping to a basic level within society. Now, I just want you for a moment uh, to imagine yourself for the next little bit of this presentation as a member of an excluded group like that, maybe a victim of domestic violence, an asylum seeker, a prison leaver, uh, somebody having difficulty with substance abuse, a traveller. And I just want you to think a little bit about the sorts of services that you might need uh, to encounter. So let's just do this little exercise in coming at this problem from a client perspective, because that's what we tried to do in the study. And just to give you a taster, when we did some earlier work around prison leavers, uh, we identified 15 different interventions that a prison leaver might well want to uh, make happen in the first fortnight after leaving prison uh, if they were going to go straight uh, and we're surprised that there's 80% reoffending rate. Um, we reviewed the available studies. There aren't many. There has not been a lot of research done in this area. We did a limited number of interviews. We didn't actually have a lot of capacity to do this. So I stress this is light touch this is not an ESRC study. The data sets. Uh, there are large gaps here, and some of these are pretty unreliable. But according to uh, ODPM definitions around housing, there are probably about a quarter of a million people in this category in the southwest. That's about 5% of the population. Um, uh, that probably understates the issue. Because, as you see from some of the other data sets here, there's a significantly larger proportion of the population in some of these areas that are in a circumstance that is likely to render them vulnerable. Some of the other indicators about, I think the whole black minority ethnic agenda in the southwest is interesting, particularly as you move further west, because you're talking about very small groups uh, that are very vulnerable and don't have the capacity to grow the self-support mechanisms that are common in most British cities. Uh, that's particularly true, I think, at the moment in Plymouth for asylum seekers. Look at some of the multiple issues. 50% of rough sleepers have mental health problems. 50% are alcoholics. 70% are misusing drugs. They have a life expectancy of 42 years. 70% of prison inmates have got two or more mental health problems. 70% are drug misusers. 67% were unemployed before they came into prison. 37% were homeless or sleeping rough. Now, I say there are, date, there are, there are gaps in that. And uh, one of the challenges, I think, to the whole research agenda is to try to understand this, uh, this community better um, but what we did was to try to look at this, as I've suggested we might do in this session, from the point of view of the client. And here are some of the quotes we got from people uh, who had encountered these services. A traveller. I went to the local surgery with my newborn baby, but they wouldn't register her. A support worker. One woman had been going to the GP surgery for 10 years with chest pains, but couldn't explain what was wrong in English. Eventually, I went with her to interpret. It turned out she had breast cancer. Um, a refugee. My 16-year-old daughter fell ill with bone marrow failure when I was an asylum seeker. They took two to three months to work out whether she was allowed to be treated on the NHS. Then it took another three to four months to get an appointment for a transplant. 
Two weeks before her operation, she had a brain hemorrhage and died. I can't say she died because of the delays in treatment, but I think an English girl would have been treated more quickly. A domestic violence victim. I told my partner I was going to the shops with my children, then left. I had nothing. I went to the benefits office for a crisis loan. They said I had to apply for a budgeting loan and it would take two and a half weeks. This is someone with no means of support. My favourite catch-22 in all of this is around prison leavers. It is an ODPM policy that prison leavers are priority group for rehousing. But the guidance on this policy states that uh, if somebody has committed a crime uh, which they knew could lead to them going into prison, then they have become voluntarily homeless and therefore they're not eligible for priority housing. Um, the learning disability point there, the frustration of not being able to uh, understand the guidance and get access to the process. Um, advice workers in housing realising uh, that you have to find a way of laying support alongside an individual uh, to overcome the problems of access. And the frustration with the interpretation of the rules leading to an awful lot of challenge. Now, it may be very good to win an appeal, but it takes a lot of time, and it's actually consuming time in terms of the uh, service providing uh, the uh, outreach from housing as well as uh, the care uh, uh, assistants working with the people in need. Now, I think you know, I stress this is not a serious academic study. And one has to be cautious about reaching judgments from this kind of approach in terms of pinning down where there are problems and why. But I think it's impossible to ex escape a conclusion that uh, there is a perception amongst disadvantaged people that the services they need are difficult to get at. Now, I'm a civil servant, and I know how dangerous it is to... Um, to allow false popular public images and myths to dominate your thinking about institutions, and I'm ade as adept as anyone else at explaining why things aren't quite what they seem to be. Uh, but I could have put up a slide, I guess, from a Yes Minister programme and told you how uh, it didn't give an accurate picture of workings inside the government, and you wouldn't have believed me, and on the whole you'd have been right. And I think that on the whole we have to recognise that perception and myth sometimes, even if they're not very strongly evidence-based, are useful clues to things that we ought to be following up. And I think public policy should be very careful about um, uh, hiding too readily behind uh, absence of scientific fact or, or the absence of hard research evidence before beginning to explore possible needs for changing policy. Um, one only thinks of BSE. Um, and I think what I would take out of the work that we've been doing here are two key structural points. The first is that vulnerable adults of this kind have a need for access to three absolutely critical uh, services in relation to supporting their lives and their health and their benefit, and their housing. And if they don't get easy access to those services, they are in serious difficulty. The second main point I'd make is that beyond just propping them up, the, the, those key interventions in support of their lives, in a perfect world there would be coherent pathways back towards a more active and positive engagement with the rest of the community. Now, a job is no doubt what would be nice at the end of it all, but it may not be the first milestone on that journey. There may be all kinds of interventions needed towards that longer-term goal. And it's very appropriate to be thinking about this at a time when the government is again bending its mind to thinking about the number of people on invalidity benefit and pathways that would take people away from that. Now, if you look at the provision in this area, the provision in the three areas I was talking about before is largely public sector, it's three big territories of public service. 
in the development of coherent pathways towards re-engagement, that kind of rehabilitative work, we're talking about a much more fragmented structure. We're talking about a lot of provision in the community and voluntary sector. We're talking about a serious lack of capacity to understand the big picture, to map it, to plan the provision. So you get some excellent interventions, but they tend to be very narrowly targeted. They're not connected. There's an awful tendency for people to get on rather a positive escalator, but to discover when they get to the top of it that there's no platform, let alone a connection to the next part of the journey, and so they fall off and a negative cycle is reinforced. Now, I just want to think a little bit about what that tells us about how we should be running public services. And going back to the Haldane model I offered you earlier, we have a structure um, which is very, very focused on um, uh, those vertical silos um, that I was talking about earlier. Under the present administration, there has been an increasing wish to see a greater joining up of the agenda. And I think one can see in a lot of the rhetoric coming out of Whitehall and a lot of the mission statements coming out of public sector institutions, a real recognition at the top that that joining up is needed. I also think that actually if you go out into the field and you talk to district nurses or social workers, for some time you found that in the, on the ground they're joining up. But as I was saying over coffee earlier, you often find they're not telling their managers about it because they're frightened they'll be told to stop. And I think the real challenge is to move from that model of a public involvement in developing the concept of joined up government into thinking about why within the middle of the silos there are so many blocks. And I think that's when I have to hold up a mirror because I think it's people like me uh, in the middle of organizations who are often the people who are actually preventing that more joined up model working. We've made, oh golly, sorry, awful, <coughs> apologies. Um, we're often the people who have made our careers by making those silos function as silos and actually remodeling our careers and our priorities to manage administrative structures in a different way, I think is the critical challenge. And I just very briefly want to share with you two things which I think are rather interesting and around at the moment. I could tell you lots about individual models of engagement that are better for specific client groups. There's fantastic work taking place at Dartmoor Prison and Exeter around prison leaving. There are very, very good drug rehab programs running in Plymouth. But I want to look at two things that are a bit bigger than that. The first is an initiative from government which has just begun branded local area agreements. For some time, local authorities have been leading things called local strategic partnerships, which try and bring together all the people interested in service delivery in an area behind a single strategy. They're good at defining the outcomes that people want. They're good at creating a common sense of vision. They have not created performance-managed frameworks for delivery. And what local area agreements are trying to do is to give teeth to that structure to look at ways of driving delivery in partnership. At the moment, they're looking at three key blocks, children's services, safer and stronger communities, healthier communities and elder care. Frankly, the definitions are as broad as you want to make them. And you can look at uh, an interpretation of what makes for a stronger community and you can get an awful lot in that. You can look at what makes for a healthier community and you can get a lot into that. The proposition from government is, you've been telling us for ages that the fragmentation is as much caused by Whitehall and its silos and its narrowly defined budgets as it is by problems of collaboration on the ground. And we're going to call your bluff, tell us what you want to do in an LAA and we'll pool the budgets. And we'll offer you freedoms and flexibilities around how services can be delivered. And we've run two pilots in the southwest, just completed, 
uh, in terms of propositions going to ministers, and they happen to be with Nick Rainsford as the responsible minister now, and I hope we'll have some decisions over the weekend on the pilots. Devon and Dorset, as I say, in the southwest, about 20 around the country as a whole, and it's been incredibly hard work. Because actually moving from knowing you want to work in this area to working out how you are actually going to work together differently and constructing the governance frameworks for it is very hard work. I think the partners have done very imaginative and successful things. But there's a huge journey uh, still to move on this. And there will shortly be a rollout of another 40 pilots and there will be other parts of the southwest joining the party. The other example I wanted to give you comes straight out of Cornwall. And it's a model led uh, by Job Centre Plus, um, uh, who in a sense, I suppose, ought to be at the centre of a lot of this because their mission is to reduce worklessness. And I think like a lot of people, they've realised that a lot of that is out of their control and they need help on things like housing, skills, um, and other uh, health uh, uh, interventions and other things. What we've done in Cornwall, led by them, is to use the availability of your European money, pooled with their money, to create 11 area pilots. And what these are doing, area by area, is trying to create that coherent framework of pathways towards re-engagement with life. Now, what Job Centre Plus did was to use the capacity of the public sector to do the mapping. They looked at area by area at the need and the potential provision. They looked at the potential alignments and they commissioned a lead agency trying to learn some of the lessons of the connection service and other operations that have taken a client-based, caseworker-driven approach. And they tried to pull together area by area a confederation uh, which would actually deliver a more integrated service. In nine of those areas, it's a community or voluntary sector body that's leading. In two of them, Job Centre Plus is doing it itself. What I think is rather interesting there is a model, not only of how to do this area of public service better, but also, and I think, and this is the point I want to finish on, I think absolutely central to making this agenda work better is the working together of the public and the community and voluntary sector. We've had propositions around compacts for a long time. And people have found it difficult to work out what the relationships ought to be. I think that this model in Cornwall is interesting because the public sector is doing what it can be quite good at, using its capacity to design the big picture and creating a framework in which the community and voluntary sector can do what it's good at, which is reaching out to clients in a much more approachable way than the public sector often is, uh, in those specific areas where they've got the enthusiasm and the knowledge to work better. I think there are some models here that suggest we really can do public service to the most excluded a lot better. But there will still be challenges, because that pressure through the silos is still very strong not only in terms of the efficiency targets, but in terms of the budgetary control. And whenever, and it happens only too often, there is a need to seek efficiency gains, which is code for cuts. It's the core business that gets retained, and the fringe business that's beginning to reach out in this kind of way that tends to come under challenge most. And I think that the... The thing all of us with any responsibility and opportunity in this area need to hang on to is that that joining up is not a marginal extra. It is actually an essential part of making public services work, and it has to receive the same degree of priority as the core business running through the silo. Thank you very much. Now, we've got about five minutes. I think I've talked too much. Uh, if anybody had any questions...
Thank you. Yes. Um, very interesting presentation, Richard. I'm, I'm David Salter. I'm a city councillor and uh, shadow cabinet member for health. I'm a former academic, so I agree with your, your statement about the difficulty of uh, making these links. It's excellent that today's working towards that. My question um, is based on your statement about the perception amongst disadvantaged people that the services they need are difficult to get at. Well, certainly I agree with that. I think that many of us would also say that, though, that there are others who are not disadvantaged who also find it difficult to access services. Um, could you, from your position as spider at the centre of the web, if I can put it that way, um, give a comment on dental services and, and the southwest <laughs> access to them, which affect not just the disadvantaged, who are even more uh, disadvantaged by unhealthy demands, but everyone. I mean, we've had, for example, the promise of two dentists out of the 1,000 promised by Dr. John Reed, which, in my view, for you know, a world-class city of a quarter of a million people, isn't enough. Is there something from within Whitehall that could be done to cut across this, you know, I, I, this situation that I think is widely recognised as, as pretty scandalous? Thank you. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a very good point. There, there is an issue of volume and there is an issue of priority in all areas of public policy. And I restrained myself uh, when talking about that problem of access from reflecting on how frightened I am every time I go to try and make an appointment with my GP's receptionist. Uh, and I think, you know, there is, there is a real challenge, I agree with you, to public service generally to make itself more accessible. The point I'm making is that I think it is particularly acute when you are dealing with people whose ability to cope with complex situations uh, is limited. Uh, so there is, I think, an issue of prioritisation. On your point about volume, uh, I think this is an issue that all administrations face in terms of balancing resources. We recognise it. At a local level, the City Council faces it in terms of thinking about how to balance its budget and decide what volume of service it can provide. It's an issue nationally. On the specific of dental services in Plymouth, I don't pretend to have an answer. But obviously it is within that general context of the problem of... Uh, straightened resources and a need to prioritise. Do you have any more questions from the floor? It's very clear. Hi, my name is Mary Cherry. I'm the work for Plymouth Primary Care Trust, which is a teaching trust, and the focus of the teaching trust is to enhance learning opportunities in the whole health community. Some of the work that we have been doing has been looking at how we can improve employment opportunities or reduce um, you know, educational deprivation and so on. And I wondered whether we could identify who in Goldsborough we can relate best to. Because as a health organisation, we have good networks with the people we always talk to. But it's very difficult to break out of that mould and identify other agencies that want to work closely with us. So I question I said you do. Thank you very much for that, and uh, I mean, it's a gentle challenge. Uh, I, as it happens, out of the back of this, this study, I talk, talked with Anne, the York Chief Executive, and with the Director of Housing in Plymouth, and with the Head of Job Centre Plus in Devon and Cornwall, to say, there does seem to be an issue here. Uh, do you think it would be interesting to use Plymouth as a case model for looking at some of these issues and seeing how we could do it better. So the simple answer to your question immediately is me and someone who works with me called Sally Axworthy who did that study. And we're very keen to follow it up because in a sense one of the nice things about Plymouth is it's big enough to have a fair number of problems, but it's also in a sense small enough to feel that you can get your hands around the scale of the issue and you might be able to do something. And the great thing in Plymouth is that people tend to know one another fairly well and therefore getting some of those alignments uh, and those movements in partnership has historically been sometimes, I think, easier in Plymouth than many cities. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Richard Bailey. Thank you. Now it gives me great pleasure to uh, ask um, Mike Kelly to join us here. I'm hoping this uh, computer is going to come back out of the screensaver in a minute. Um, Professor Mike Kelly is um, a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He was director of research 
for the HPA until about last week. His job title has just changed. He may tell us about that. Um, and uh, he's going to speak about evidence-based healthcare. So, Mike, please. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning to those watching uh, on the web, and uh, good morning to those of you here in uh, here in Plymouth. Uh, my topic this morning is evidence-based healthcare, um, a topic close to my heart since uh, five years ago I gave up being an academic and uh, joined government, uh, joined the National Health Service in an effort to, uh, to work on the question of building, my job then was to build the evidence base in public health and I'll share with you some of the issues and problems that arise from taking that approach. But in order to contextualise it, I want to take you through a sort of brief history of the development of the evidence-based approach. I think if you're outside of uh, the um, cognoscenti, so to speak, a lot of people think they know what evidence-based means. They think it means using evidence. Actually, it means much more than that. It means taking a very systematic approach to using evidence. Probably the best-known first example of the systematic use of evidence was when James Lynn, the Edinburgh physician, discovered uh, the impact of uh, fruit uh, in preventing scurvy among seafarers. Uh, in probably what was the first controlled trial, he compared the impact of different foods on the sailors and see, saw which ones um, got better. Paris in the 19th century um, sees the first use of really systematic um, statistical data by Pierre-Charles Alexandre Louis. Fisher in the 1920s here in Britain began to develop statistical techniques which we all still learn. Um, and then just after the war, the work of um, Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill in the early work on the smoking trials, um, followed by the streptomycin trial in 1948, set in process what was really a fundamental scientific shift, the development of the controlled clinical trial and the ability to detect a true effect scientifically. But that was more than 50 years ago. And actually, although many people, there's a, there's a great volume of people who are very critical of the randomized trial approach in medicine and in the social sciences, and rightly so to some extent. But actually, it was never a done deal, even from 50 years ago. And in order to see how things have developed, it's worth recalling the work of this chap, um, Archie Cochran, and especially the book published in 1972 called Effectiveness and Efficiency, which he rather mischievously subtitled Random Reflections on Health Services, which really, it seems to me, set the agenda, at least in Britain anyway, for what was to become the evidence-based approach in medicine, and more recently, the evidence-based approach more generally, both in policy and in public health. Cochrane actually was a really interesting figure, uh, a really exotic chap in many ways. He qualified in medicine just before the Second World War, um, swiftly went out to Spain to join the anti-Franco forces out there. On the outbreak of war um, in Europe, he returned to Britain, uh, joined the army, was captured by the Germans at the Battle of Crete in 1941, and spent the rest of the war in a prisoner of war camp in the Balkans, caring for Russian prisoners of war. A pretty hopeless uh, medical task. And actually, many have argued that some of the basic principles that he developed arose out of that experience. He himself describes himself as being a complete pain in the side of the British medical establishment. And in his own obituary, which he wrote himself, um, he points out that he never received a merit award um, in spite of uh, the very interesting um, contribution that he made. Cochrane's principles enunciated in that book are fourfold. First, the notion of universalism. He passionately believed that the best care should be available to everybody. But, second principle, you needed a method to determine what the best care was. You couldn't assume that doctors would tell you what the best care was. Doctors would tell you what they learned in medical school or what the drug companies were telling them to prescribe. They wouldn't necessarily tell you what was best for you you begin to get a sense, perhaps, of why he was unpopular with some of his colleagues. He also argued very strongly for rooting out harmful or useless practice, the principle of compassion. He argued, like others were arguing at the time, like Illich, um, McEwen, that much of what was done in medicine was harmful. 
dangerous or did no good at all. And fourthly, very radically, he suggested we needed a method to work out what it cost. In 1972, no one knew, um, and indeed the, the National Health Service, although it hadn't reached that point then, was moving towards a point at which demand was going to outstrip supply and it was going to face the funding crisis which hit it in the 1980s. But not it's worth looking at that book. It's uh, more than 30 years old and it rambles on in places, but I think it's a fundamental text. Cochrane's scientific legacy seems to me to be uh, in three, three, three important ways. One, he argued for, in the 1970s, the fundamental importance of the randomised controlled trial as the only method to determine what the best interventions would be. Bear in mind that's more than 30 years ago, but it was a radical proposal then, and most of the opposition to that proposal came from the medical profession, not from scientists. Things move on. His second legacy was really the discipline of health economics. He was great friends with Professor Alan Williams at the University of York, of course, who went on to develop the idea of the quality-adjusted life year. And, of course, he gave us a fantastic epistemological controversy about what was knowledge. How could we know what were the best evidence? He opened up this whole debate about the nature of evidence and good evidence. But still, come 1998, more than, uh, what, 16 years on from the publication of the book, the House of Lords Select Committee was able to observe, echoing what was said by the first speaker, that too little research was being carried out which was relevant to practitioners, policy makers and managers in the National Health Service. Well, things haven't moved on greatly since 1988, one might argue. But actually, in order to try and put that right, in following the uh, 88 Select Committee report, the NHS Research and Development Strategy was put in place. And this set about, among other things, to put in place an evidence-based approach to healthcare uh, in Great Britain and to put the National Health Service on an evidence-based platform. But again, not a done deal, as you'll see. The legacy of the Select Committee and the NHS R&D strategy, we've seen the formation of the Cochrane and Campbell collaborations, Cochrane collaboration named after Archie Cochrane, the purpose of which is to try and get um, academic and other institutions working together to produce best evidence. And this, in turn has led to the rise of the systematic review and of meta-analysis as a way of aggregating data in order to get at the best approach to evidence, the establishment of the NHS Centre of Reviews and Dissemination in York, now known just as the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination at the University of York there, to do that kind of, to do among, amongst other things, that sort of aggregation. The establishment in 1999 of the National Institute for Clinical Excellence to apply these processes to decisions about technologies in healthcare and about m modes of treatment and protocols of treatment. In Wales, the development of the Health Evidence Bulletin Wales organisation to provide similar sorts of information for the Welsh Assembly. The establishment in 2000 of the Health Development Agency to try and bring an evidence-based approach to public health. And the whole guideline development movement that's gone on in this country, in Canada, the United States and Australia uh, and some parts of Europe to bring a more rational approach to protocols for care. And all of these things, it seems to me, flow out of that approach. But of course, the reality on the front line, as Richard observed, as any practitioner will observe, is that notwithstanding uh, this intellectual impetus towards an evidence-based approach, we're still have quite a long way to go in making it happen, and there's still quite a lot of problems in making it happen. I suppose you might say, well, I must have a fantastic vested interest in all of this. Um, as Ray said, I, I worked, still work until the end of this month for the Health Development Agency. At the end of the month, that agency emerges with the National Institute for Clinical Excellence with NICE, and we move over there, and the two, the clinical and public health arms of the evidence-based approach within the National Health Service and beyond come together. Quite an exciting development. But we still face a fair bit of opposition. And those of you that might have watched the controversy over NICE's recommendation on Alzheimer's pre uh, prescription last week will recognise that sometimes the evidence doesn't tell people what they want to hear. 
And that's quite an interesting, because then people say the evidence is wrong. And that's an interesting kind of approach. Well, what is evidence-based medicine? Sackett and his colleagues, uh, a little less than 10 years ago, said, it's the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Trish, Trish Greenhouse, a little more recently, described it as the enhancement of clinicians' traditional skills in diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and related areas through, again, the systematic, that word comes up again and again, use of relevant and answerable questions and the use of mathematical estimates of probability and risk in treatment. So what are the principles behind this that arise from what Sackett has said? What is it that gets people so exercised? What is it that makes converts like me into the evidence-based movement? And I should say in parenthesis, I used to be, I am still a sociologist. Uh, I used to be a qualitative sociologist. I've had some very um, amusing interchanges with people who sort of style me as a sort of guru of positivism now that I talk about these sorts of things. Um, but... Uh, I have a rather pluralistic approach to these things, as you'll see. Well, what are the principles? One, the accumulation of evidence, not just relying on the last study, not the Today Programme approach to evidence. You know the Today Programme approach? Scientists have found a relationship between X and Y. Minister, what are you doing about it? Not, how does that study fit in with the last 30 years of research, which is, of course, the way we should be approaching it. The accumulation of evidence... The aggregation of evidence, putting it together. And I should say, aggregation doesn't mean only quantification. It's the aggregation of all forms of evidence. And I think one of the criticisms that's often made the evidence-based approach is it's assumed, because of where it started with the randomised control trial, that it's only about RCTs. It isn't. It's about the aggregation of evidence from a variety of sources, methodologically and philosophically. It's about the synthesis of evidence, about putting it together and trying to make sense of it within a single whole. And the purpose of it behind all of that is to avoid bias. Because although there are zillions, well, many hundreds of thousands at any rate, of scientific journals, much of what is published is biased. It is not the truth. It is perhaps scientists' best estimates of getting to the truth. But there is always bias in scientific research. I was an academic for 27 years. I know what that means. It means trying to get your paper published. It means trying to get the score up for the next research assessment exercise. It means getting the paper published by, by manipulating your data till it's accepted by the BMJ. And that sometimes moves you a long way from some kind of objective notion of truth. The biggest problem of all is when you spent five years on a study and your results are inconclusive. Because by and large, there's a publication bias against null findings. Journals aren't very interested in publishing studies which say we did this for five years, we didn't find any kind of significant result. You actually don't make a glamorous career as an academic by going to conferences, well, you're no, you don't get invited to glamorous conferences in Milan if all you go there is say, well, I spent five years and actually our hypothesis was wrong. Um, that's not how you build an academic career. Building the evidence then involves searching for those studies in order to do the aggregation. Choosing the best studies methodologically, and that doesn't mean one type of method, but it means the best studies within the methodological traditions you're working to, and summing the results if it's possible. But it's been slow progress. And it's been slow for a number of reasons. One, in policy terms, you get a commitment to a particularly policy option in spite of what the evidence says. Um, I've, been, I've found it fascinating working in government, I must say, and from time to time we present the information, but the policy option is rejected because, of course, it doesn't suit where policy wants to go. And so it should be, of course, in a democratic society. Science is not the answer, necessarily. Um, I call it the Mintzberg option. Mintzberg was a famous management scientist who learned um, that all those gurus in Harvard that had been arguing that the way managers made decisions was by building carefully loads and loads of evidence and then coming to a decision. In fact, what he discovered was that the way managers, top managers at any rate, in American corporations used information was they made the decision, then went and found the information they wanted to justify the decision they'd made. That's the Mintzberg approach, and that's actually how policies often made uh, in this country. 
Commitments to particular epistemological positions. I love the word epistemology. I get it, as Ray will confirm, in every lecture I've ever given, every talk. Um, what it actually means is your different approach to knowledge, different approaches to knowledge. I call that the Jowett dilemma, which I'll explain in a moment. But it's basically the view that I encounter all the time as I go around talking about the evidence-based approach, which is, look, I'm a serious professor in the university of somewhere very old. And at the University of Somewhere Very Old, we know what knowledge is. We don't need you people down in London in the civil service telling us what knowledge is. I wouldn't be a professor if I didn't know what knowledge is. And of course, sometimes there's simply a lack of evidence. As I've said in that first presentation, so often when you hit a real problem area, a wicked issue, those difficult interfaces in policy, the research simply hasn't been done. The Jowett dilemma comes from Benjamin Jowett, was master of Balliol, uh, in Oxford in the 19th century, and the students made up a rhyme about him. So arrogant was this man. The students said at a pantomime they put on uh, in the 1870s, first come I, my name is Jowett, and there is no knowledge, but I know it. I am master of this college. What I don't know isn't knowledge. Now, I'm sure no one at the University of Plymouth holds to this view, but believe me, at some of the universities, there's some very eminent places uh, with Professor very self-important, it's certainly still the case. Institutional resistance. Prejudice. I already know the answer. I don't need evidence to tell me. Lack of fit. That's not the answer I wanted from the evidence. Institutional inertia. We're simply too busy in the National Health Service to take any notice of the evidence. We've got this target, that target, this target to meet. Antipathy towards the evidence. Well, in the case of when we were the Health Development Agency, we used to get looked at, but used to, you used to be the Health Education Authority. What do you know about evidence? Don't you publish books on sex for school children? Um, a disappointment. Is that all there is in the evidence for you to talk about? Ian Chalmers, a great guru in the evidence-based approach, wrote uh, two or three years ago, as a result of the slow progress in adopting scientifically defensible methods of research synthesis in healthcare. care, the limited resources made available for research continue to be squandered on ill-conceived studies and as a result patients and others continue to suffer unnecessarily. And I suggest to you that's a real challenge for us um, to, 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 to see if we can disprove uh, Surya and Chalmers' argument. Now my job for the last uh, five years and into the new organisation of NICE is to try and apply these evidence-based principles in public health. <clears throat> and in the new um, NICE organisation that comes into operation from the 1st of April, uh, there will be an organisation called the Centre for Public Health Excellence, which will take forward this idea of applying um, the evidence-based approach from evidence-based medicine more broadly in clinical medicine. And we're going to ask and have asked three simple questions about public health interventions, which range beyond, of course, um, what goes on in the National Health Service into the areas of education, local government and elsewhere. What's effective? Do we know what's effective? Do we know what's ineffective? How much are we doing in the name of public health that actually does no good or is positively dangerous? And just reflect upon a moment the number of things that have been done in the name of public health in the last 30 years which have never been evaluated properly. There's a huge amount. But there are, of course, some key problems in taking forward an evidence-based approach in these wicked areas. First of all, there's a pronounced lack of evidence of what works. In one paper I published with some colleagues a couple of years ago, we reviewed uh, the whole output of um, the British Academy in public health, medical sociology, health psychology, health economics, uh, epidemiology, and clinical medicine for studies of what worked to improve public health with respect to improving health inequalities reducing health inequalities, and less than a half a percent of published British studies actually deal with that. The rest of them deal with telling us we've got a problem of health inequalities and how bad it is, and let's wring our hands at how awful things are. But to try and tell us what we can do about it to make things better, and not do as the example that Richard used of A-levels, we can get health improvement actually quite effectively. Year on year, health gains in this country have been fantastic. But at the same time, the gap between the health of the best and least advantage in our country gets worse year on year. And there's precious little in the evidence that can tell us what we can do about that. There's a lack of good trial data, and there's hardly any at all 
economic data that can tell us anything about cost effectiveness. Where the evidence exists, it tends to be about um, downstream interventions, about one-to-one -one counselling in smoking cessation, about one-to-one -one counselling in teenage pregnancy reduction. There's very, very little which evaluates the effects of policy. Interestingly, where there are policy evaluations, they tend to be about those, um, if you like, the elastoplast policies, sure start, health action zones. We know quite a bit about them. But what about mainstream fiscal, economic, taxation policies? What about mainstream education, social justice policies and their impact on health? You look in vain in the literature to find anything other than statements at very high levels of generality, almost nothing that will help you identify the causal pathway and therefore the point of intervention where you might do something about it in an evidence-based fashion. We're especially weak and I'm a sociologist, and I'll say this to any sociologist in the audience and others, about understanding the structure of our population. We're very familiar in medicine with the idea of biological variation and the fact that if we were to administer the same dose of the drug to everyone in this room, a drug to everyone in this room, there would be biological variation in your responses. We take that for granted in clinical trials of drugs. Public health has failed to recognise seriously that in terms of responses to public health interventions, that the, bio, the social variation in the population is such that you get different responses in different segments of the population to the same intervention. Well, we've known it for years, of course. When I first started teaching 30 years ago, we used to talk about differential responses to health education for smoking reduction. We knew that the middle classes were abandoning the smoking habit in their millions and that working class people weren't. The theory was that it would be a drop-down effect, a sort of trickle-down effect over the years. Actually, it hasn't happened. It's got worse. Um, the fact that you get differential response to different to the same interventions um, is, is such a blindingly obvious point, but one that scarcely made any impact on policy until very, very recently. The recent white paper acknowledges it, and the delivery plan that was published yesterday acknowledges it, but that's really pretty new. When should we measure the effectiveness of public health interventions? When will we know if our teenage conception prevention strategy has been successful? When will we know if our smoking cessation strategy has been successful? Six months, three months, one year, ten years. Bit of a problem. And above all else, the evidence that there doesn't tell you a huge amount. It frequently tells you nothing about how to do a public health intervention. When I worked with uh, Ray in Glasgow, um, I took part in a huge clinical trial of, the, of, of examining the impact of a, a, a project called Good Hearted Glasgow. It was a health promotion intervention. And at the end of it, uh, we published papers in the BMJ and a number of scientific journals. And if you want to know what Good Hearted Gla Glasgow did as an intervention, you read our scientific papers in vain. We never told anybody. We just said there was an intervention in health promotion. We got all the p-values in there. Uh, we got great... Um, statistical significance and we got wonderful results but no one reading those papers would have a clue what you actually did to the clients to get these effects. Now we're not unique. Very, very few scientific papers in public health actually tell you what the intervention was and how to do it. Tell you almost nothing about the processes of intervention, any problems of inter implementation, nor very specifically about how the local infrastructures of delivery impacted on what you were doing. Because you don't build a scientific career talking about little local difficulties. In fact, when you go to conferences, you bypass them and you say something, uh, say something rather different. So we've come to conceptualise the problem of doing evidence-based approach, at least in public health and more broadly in policy, in, in a slightly different way. The science that's there, and you use an evidence-based approach and you test it and aggregate it in all the ways that come down from Cochrane and Ian Chalmers and those earlier pioneers... But in the end, the science provides you with a measure of plausibility. A scientific assessment, biologically, organisationally or socially, a framework of how things will work. But in order to understand how things will work in practice, in other words, the likelihood of success, you need an understanding of the nature of local conditions married to an understanding of the tacit knowledge of local practitioners. It's that call, you know, when in the earlier diagram that uh, Richard put up of bringing the joined up approach up and down, a similar thing is required in science too, to bring the knowledge of what people do on the ground 
and marry it to the science. And we've been engaged in fieldwork trials for the last three years now, and we're moving them over into NICE in doing precisely that uh, in our collaborating centres. And that is to allow us to think beyond the evidence. I am a proponent of the evidence-based approach, and I believe that the arguments of Cochrane, Ian Chalmers and others must be taken very seriously because they challenge us to do evidence properly. They challenge us to get the evidence right. But in the end, the evidence will only provide us with a framework of plausible possibilities. In other words, a starting point for interventions, not an imperative or a recipe for what to do. We need to get locally based practitioners involved on the ground to help us to think about being creative beyond the evidence but also to get the researchers to think creatively about their evidence and, and to stop that point that, that, that was made in the first, the first presentation where the in, in, individuals, um, the academics say, so what, it's not my responsibility. With two minutes to go I get to the conclusion. The idea of the evidence-based approach is to embrace a range of different evidence and learning, to bring evidence from traditional research and evidence from practice and policy together, and to put practice back into evidence. Thank you very much. We may have time for one, one question from the floor, if someone has a, a burning question. We haven't got anything coming in off the internet. We have uh, Jenny, yes, we thank you. Um, Jenny, Jenny Morris. Morris, Principal Lecturer based in the Faculty here. Um, one of the roles I have is teaching evidence-based practice and clinical effectiveness to our undergraduates. Um, and I was really heartened by your slide saying that we need to consider a range of evidence and to be challenged by the implementation issues. The tension a lot of our um, <coughs> professionals we work with is the access to that evidence. And you quite rightly pointed to lots of publications in the form of information coming out of NICE clinical guidelines. There's the Cochrane base, there's the National, National Electronic Library for Health. But in terms of busy professionals, accessing that evidence in such a way that can inform practice collectively is very difficult. Yeah. And I just wondered what your view was on that. Well, acknowledge absolutely that problem. Um, and what we are trying to... First of all, I think we will acknowledge that it's, it's a waste of time expecting people to access the raw data and information. That's not going to work. It has to be presented in a summary form which is usable and gets you way past all those methodological problems. They're very interesting, but they, people on the ground need to know what to do, how to do it, and to, to have faith in the evidence that's in front of them. And what both HDA and NICE are moving towards is the production of exactly that kind of guide um, which the practitioner can use on the ground. But I'd be really, really interested if you want to email me, and, 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 you know, because we can only get that right if the practitioners tell us. It has to, it has to be exactly what the field work brings back. Says, no, we don't in, not interested in that. We need to know this, this, and this. And although sometimes people's hearts sink when there's just two bullet points, um, that has, has actually to be the way that we do it. We're, we're going to end our transmission at this point. Thank you very much for watching on the internet and the TV. And that's the end of our TV programme, but we can carry on here with further questions uh, if other people have them here. So, thank you very much for watching. And any more questions? Um, can, I, can I take you a minute, David? Um, I have a skirt in here, please. Bye.